there's a clash coming. And there's no way we're going to sail around the clash. The confrontation is inevitable. The confrontation that is coming so it's between Christian fundamentalism and Malta. My question is, who creates the violence in the name of religion so that you can finally end the violence in the name of religion? We are living in very, very serious times. They want the church and the state together to regulate conscience. So this is an appeal to the Protestant world. Will you look at your roots? Don't give up what others were prepared to die for. Tonight we're going to talk about Malta and this clash that is coming. But before we get to the actual clash, and before we get to the actual events just before the close of probation of this Earth's history, I want to first give a little bit of background as to how the whole system has been set up. Because the Bible calls the devil the deceiver, doesn't it? So deception is his game. And he's had plenty of experience in it, and he's very good at it. And he's learned a couple of tricks through the ages. Now, we know that the papal system has a militia, has an army. And they are run like an army, but they don't have the hardware. They use the weaponry and the hardware of nations in order to do what they have to do. But in order to do that, they must have control of those nations. Else who would do their bidding, isn't that so? So let's see how these military orders operate. And the two that are, of course, particularly prominent are the Knights of Malta, which are the oldest which is the oldest military order in the Roman Catholic system. It existed before the Crusades. And then the Jesuits, which became the specialists overseeing the running of operations. And they received their marching orders when the crisis facing the Church of Rome was the greatest in their history. Now, if we go to Rome and we go to uh, Chiesa Jesu, which is the church of the Jesuits, and uh, it is a magnificent building. If you look at the front, there are two statues over there. And the one is of Ignatius Loyola, and the other one is of Francis Xavier, two of the, counting, the founding fathers of the Jesuit order, the third one being Peter Faber. So the, the nations were well represented. And he's standing, Ignatius is standing on a woman, crushing her under his foot. Now, obviously we know what a woman is in a biblical sense, it's a church. And so two of the founding fathers are standing on two principal movements. The probability is high that it represents the Lutherans and the Calvinists. Luther and Calvin. Now I say the probability is high because if you go into the church, they made no bones about it because prior to Vatican II, they had plaques telling you what it was all about. And so you could read it for yourself. Subsequently, after Vatican II, some of these plaques have been removed. So now it's relatively vague, but the statues, of course, have not been removed. 
This is the famous one of Mary throwing the two people that seem to paint them in particular. In this case, it was Johann Hus and Martin Luther out of heaven. And assisting her is this little cherub over here, and he's ripping the pages of the writings of Martin Luther and probably those of Hus to shreds in the process. So the scriptures are being eradicated by Mary. Now, as you know, Mary is considered the mediatrix of all graces, uh, of all grace, and the co-advocate or the advocate for the people of God. So here is another mediator, but the Bible says there is only one mediator between man and God. And then Mary, of course, was born immaculate, which means without sin. But the Bible says that she was born under the law, like any other woman, in other words, under the condemnation of the law. Now, if she was in this immaculate state, then that means that Jesus didn't come all the way down. And it also, of course, negates the plan of salvation. Because if God could declare one person immaculate without the atoning blood, then he could do it for all. So in Catholic theology, the atonement, the shedding of blood, was not essential to your salvation. Atonement is not essential. It is the good works of Christ that made for the atonement. But to that works, you can all to those good works, you can also add the good works of the saints, and you can add, of course, the good works of Mary. So it is a a basket of good works from which the papacy can draw. So this theology negates Jesus Christ in the sense of having died for you. It negates the atonement, which is a very serious issue. Now we've had a previous lecture about that. But then, to make it uh, quite clear what the issue is, you have this statue over here, uh, not in this particular uh, cathedral, but in the Ignatius Loyola one. And uh, here, Ignatius is standing on Martin Luther. And Martin Luther has in his hand the scriptures, but they're closed. And in his hands, he has a document which is Marian. So by the power of Mary, he will eradicate Martin Luther or the Protestant Reformation and the scripture in particular. And uh, seeing that I'm currently in Canada, I thought it would be nice to remind you that they found this so important, this eradication and annihilation of true Protestantism, that they erected the same statue in Quebec as a reminder to the Protestant uh, nation of Canada that this enclave that is in the heart of it has a philosophy, or is run by a philosophy, that will eventually eradicate Protestantism. And I see we can, I think we can see it quite clearly in the world as to how brilliantly they perform that strategy. Now, we have to know what we are dealing with. Because this is not one Christian religion against another Christian religion. These are two diametrically opposed ideologies. And I have to go back to Gnosticism. Now Gnosticism is a religious form which elevates man to the level of deity and negates the necessity of salvation in the ultimate deity, which is Jesus Christ. So it is a man-centered religion. Now, if you go to the Gnostic Society Library, they talk about the Hermetic tradition represents a non-Christian lineage of Hellenistic Gnosticism. This is from the horse's mouth, so that you understand where we're coming from. This is Greek philosophy. The tradition and its writings date to at least the first century before the Common Era, 
which in the good old days was called before Christ. Uh, and the texts we possess were all written prior to the second century common era. The surviving writings of the tradition known as the, the Corpus Hermeticum, or the Hermetic body of writings, was lost to the Latin West of the classical times, but survived in Eastern Byzantine libraries. Their rediscovery and translation into Latin during the late 15th century by the Italian Renaissance court of Cosimo de Medici provides a seminal force in the development of Renaissance thought and culture. So this is straight from the horse's mouth. This is where we get it from. And how did it come into possession of the Vatican? That is the question. Well, the key lies with Cosimo de Medici. There are the Medicis, a very, very prominent medieval family. They were the kings and queens, and lines of popes came from their ranks. So this was the Medici family, a fascinating family. And we have to go into a little bit of, of history. Cosima also organized the methodical search for ancient manuscripts, both within Christendom and even with Sultan Mehmed II's permission in the East. And uh, they were busy with ecumenical councils about the divisions, the Church of the East and Rome. And in this process, he managed to get permission to gather all of these ancient Greek manuscripts of Gnosis, of the Hermetic Fathers, the Greek Fathers of the ancient religions. And he started a library. And he gathered all of these occult writings. He was well prepared for the singular opportunity that came his way in 1439, when he succeeded in enticing the Ecumenical Council from Ferrara to Florence, the Council of Florence, and his most important success in foreign relations was to get hold of these manuscripts. Now, we don't have to read the whole document, but th basically this is the teaching of the ancient Greeks and it had been lost to the Western world. Now if we go to another source, which is of course just a general source, Wikipedia, it tells you the House of Medici and who they were, just for general information. You can see they were a political dynasty. They were a banking family, so they had the banks behind them, they had the policies behind them, the politics behind, politics behind them, they were a royal house, and uh, they owned the Medici Bank, and then, of course, the popes that came from their lineage were Pope Leo X and Pope Clement and Pope Pius, etc. All of these were in the Medici family. And via this move, the Medici library became part of the Vatican Library. And this ancient knowledge, this gnosis, this knowledge, was the core of Vatican thinking and theology. And it was a man-centered religion. Just another source to give us a little bit of information. The Hermetic tradition represents a non-Christian lineage of Hellenistic Gnosticism. The central text of the tradition, the Corpus Hermeticum, uh, is comprised of 18 tracts, and they, even this society which uh, belongs to the Semitic society in, in the world, propagates this Gnosticism. Now this particular learning, this occult learning, this Gnostic learning, was handed over when Ignatius Loyola came on the scene. There were negotiations as to what the role of the Jesuits would be, and the answer is they were to champion the war against Protestantism and introduce a different set of learning to the world in competition with that which was propagated by Protestantism. So here were two ideologies, and the champions of this ideology was to be the Jesuits. 
So to regain its lost supremacy, the papacy employed the Jesuits to destroy Protestantism, but they had to do it morally, they had to do it politically, and they had to do it ecclesiastically. And this was a major problem. To undermine sola scriptura, they had to not only undermine the veracity of the Bible, they had to destroy the faith that people had in the Bible, and they had to question the validity of the Bible. And so this is where the wrangling about the Word of God started. And they employed a strategy by becoming the schoolmasters of Europe, and they put learning against learning. Now the learning that they introduced was Gnosticism, and they opposed biblical teaching with Gnosticism. Now, I have a simple question. To the fallen nature, which one would be more acceptable? Where you elevate yourself to the level of deity, or where you repent of your sins, change your ways, and come back into the conformity of God's will? Which one would be easier? Surely, the Jesuits had uh, an advantage as far as that was concerned. So, how did they go about it? Another Medici, Leo X's first cousin, uh, Giulio, took the papal name Clement VII. Just as Leo X's corruption had ignited Luther, Clement VII's shrewdness determined how the church would deal with the proliferation of Bibles. Here was a problem. Bibles were being printed everywhere. Clement was personally advised by one of his advisors, the inventor of modern political science and Cardinal Thomas Wolseley, a Chancellor of England, and he opined that both printing and Protestantism could be turned to Rome's advantage by employing movable type to produce a literature that would confuse, diminish, and ultimately marginalize the Bible. Cardinal Wolseley, who would later found Christ Church College at Oxford, characterized the project to put learning against learning. So this is where this terminology came from. And since printing cannot be put down, he said, it is best to set up learning against learning and by introducing all persons to dispute to dispend the laity between fear and controversy. This at most will make them attentive to their superiors and teachers. In other words, you create so much confusion that people don't know where to turn to, and they will turn to the teachers. It's a very clever strategy. Very clever strategy. And against the Bible learning, which demonstrated how man could have eternal life simply by believing in the facts of Christ's death and resurrection, would be put the learning of the Gnostics. Gnosticism held out the hope that man could achieve everlasting life by doing good works himself. So, this is what they did. And, of course, they had the basic library of Cosima. Martin Luther, on the other hand, opposed this. He saw what was happening. And Martin Luther, seeing that learning against learning was the future for Christianity, voiced an appeal to the ruling classes in 1520, in which he wrote rather prophetically, Though our children live in the midst of a Christian world, they faint and perish in misery, because they lack the gospel in which we should be training and exercising them all the time. I advise no one to place his child where the scriptures do not reign paramount. Listen carefully to these words. Schools will become wide open gates of hell if they do not diligently engrave the Holy Scriptures on young hearts. Every institution where men are not increasingly occupied with the Word of God must become corrupt. To think that all the universities started out as religious schools, and today they are corrupt when it comes to teaching truth. All of them teach evolution. The Word of God is marginalized, if not maligned. 
It was inevitable that the Council of Trent would establish the Jesuits as the schoolmasters of Europe. And in the various countries, in Portugal and in Europe, these schools were started. And eventually, they had a network where learning was placed against learning, and it would expand by 1749 to 669 colleges, 176 seminaries, 61 houses of studies, and 24 universities, either partly or wholly under the control of the Jesuits. So the Jesuits became the schoolmasters of Europe. And drama and acting and Gnosticism became the norm. In England, they didn't have a foot, foothold, because it was a Protestant nation, and they were banned from exercising any rights in that country. And so they used their, their spies, as it were, and one of them, of course, was William Shakespeare. To be or not to be, that is the question. And then he rambles on in his Hamlet, whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of trouble. And then he talks about the death of sleep and the natural shocks of this life and the, and the peaceful sleep and uh, new existence that comes in death. For in that sleep of death, what dreams may come? Can you see how thoughts are implanted in minds? And so philosophies are introduced in a dramatic form and they stick to the mind much easier than truth. And this was the way in which they operated. Now if we go to times closer to ours, we read very similar statements to what Martin Luther said in the Spirit of Prophecy. Infidelity is increasing in our land, our youth are sent to college, and are brought into association with those who hold skeptical views. For even well-educated young men now boast of their unbelief in the Word of God. Who is chargeable for the state of affairs? Is it not chargeable to those who from the sacred desk have belittled the claims of the Lord God, of God? Is it not chargeable to those who lead men away from the path of truth by terming the law of God a yoke of bondage, etc. So it's a very similar sentiment. In another one she says, if morality and religion are to live in a school, it must be through a knowledge of God's word. Some may urge that if religious teaching is to be made prominent, our schools will become unpopular, that those who are not of our faith, will not patronize the college very well then. Let them go to other colleges. This is powerful stuff. Our school was established not merely to teach the sciences, but for the purpose of giving instruction in the great principle of God's word and in the practical duties of everyday life. Now the following statement is really quite mind-blowing. This is the education so much needed at the present time. If a worldly influence is to bear sway in our school, then sell it out to worldlings. And let them take entire control, and those who have invested their means, start another one. So God's word must be paramount, because there is a war. And all the great colleges and universities of the world are not following the Bible principle, they're following the Gnostic principle where God's word is ridiculed and marginalized. That's Gnosticism. Now, how did they manage to set this up on a worldwide scale? How did they manage to do this even in Protestant ranks? And how did they get control of nations that call themselves Protestant without anyone knowing how it was done? It takes a brilliant mind to do that, don't you think? It takes a brilliance which is supernatural in order to achieve this. Now the general, at the time, just before the mortal wound which Rome received when it lost its political power in 1798, and the period just thereafter, was General Ricky. And the Protestant world was 
warned by all the great Protestant leaders, beware of these systems. Martin Luther had spoken very strongly. And nations had formed on the principles of either Catholicism or Protestantism. The Protestant nations were already uh, wonky because they were already sending their best children or, or the elite children to the Jesuit schools because they had such a good name and such a good reputation and such a scholastic image. But the Word of God was missing. And the Protestant nations had rejected Jedu Jesuitism and prevented them from taking hold. So how do you hoodwink the Protestant world? Well, General Rickey's war, at the 19th General Congregation, Rickey was elected Superior General. And during his reign, suddenly, the Jesuits were being expelled all over Europe. An amazing thing happened. And they had expulsion from Portugal the year after his election, 1758. And the history books tell us that the people were sick and tired of political intrigues and the machinations and workings of the Jesuit order. So Portugal banned them in 1758. France banned the Jesuits in 1764, all during the reign of Ricky. This is now what history tells us. This is what Wikipedia writes. And the helpless Ricky saw it all. And the helpless general of the, of the Jesuit order wrote letters to all the Jesuits over the world and said, pray, pray, pray. We're going through terrible times. Be humble. Pray, pray, pray. Now, I have a question. These nations that banned the Jesuit order, one after the other, were they Protestant nations or were they Catholic nations? Now, who controlled the morality and the thinking and the strategy of those nations? Wasn't it the Roman Catholic Church? Because there was a massive divide between Protestantism and Catholicism. So the Protestant nations rallied together and the Catholic nations rallied around their church. So who better to organize this than Ricky himself? So is it possible that neither Portugal, I'm just asking a question, history will say I'm wrong. Is it possible that Portugal and France and Spain and Naples and all these countries only supposedly rejected the, the Jesuits? Well, it was very realistic because they dumped them onto ships and those that were old and frail died in the process. They shipped them off to the Vatican and the Jesuits spread out in the secular world, some of them left the church, became secular. Some of them uh, clung to their priesthood and became normal, non-Jesuit priests, as it were. And the Jesuit order disappeared. Now, the Vatican hadn't banned the Jesuit at such a stage yet. The spiritually inclined superior general sent circular letters of fervent perseverance in prayer. And then, after his election, Clement the 14th took harsh and humiliating decisions against the society in order to placate its enemies. So apparently, under pressure from all these Catholic nations, the Pope himself banned the Jesuits. This is what the history books tell us. But political pressure went on unrelenting and the Pope finally suppressed the order. And uh, this was the order of 21 July 1773, the main reason being that he wanted to restore peace in the church. So the Pope suppressed the Jesuits. Now here's an interesting book. It's called The Art of War. And uh, it's all about a general called Sun Tzu. 
Now the book was first translated into the French language in 1772. Interesting date. Just before the banning of the Jesuits. And it was written by a French Jesuit by the name of Jean-Joseph Marie Amiot, and he was the astronomer to the Emperor of China. And a partial translation into English was attempted in 1905. So here was a book, and uh, it was translated into French, and it told the story of this general of the Chinese army more than 800 years ago. Apparently, a translation of a legendary general, who probably is fictitious and never existed, but uh, nevertheless, he's spoken about in many circles, and this book is actually compulsory reading uh, for military generals and in the military schools, even of the United States of America. So it must be very important if it's uh, compulsory reading. So we have to understand. Now the story is about the general, whose name is Sun Tzu, and he was the general of the army of King Helu, who is also known as King Hu, and the country was Wu. And it's interesting that this man, of course, spoke fluent Chinese, because he was the astronomer of the Emperor of China. Now, if you go to Japan, there's a massive statue of the, the general Sun Tzu that you can find there, so he's a prominent legendary figure. Now, on page 490 of his book, The Jesuits, Malachi Martin implies that if a Jesuit writes a book, it is, in essence, the general of the Jesuits himself who sanctions it in view of the oath of obedience. A Jesuit will only put a book out that represents the view of the general. But a Jesuit can also put a book out that is not only the view of the general, but the writings of the general himself. Are you with me? So this fictitious character may have never existed, Sun Tzu. And it must be an allegory that tells us something. Now the most brilliant strategist will tell you what his strategy is, they do this in chess, and then proceed to defeat you using the very strategy that he's made known in the first place. Then you prove your brilliance beyond a shadow of doubt. Now, the story goes that the king of Wu was in serious trouble because his enemies had surrounded him and was taking one piece of territory after the other away from him. And he had such a problem in his nation that eventually he summoned this great general, or the general came to him and said, I can solve your problem. I can solve your problem for you. And he said, my problem is too great. My problem cannot be solved. The general said, yes, I can solve your problem for you. So let's call him King Hu. King Hu said, how would you solve it? And he said, by raising an army that's invincible, that is so organized, that is so precise, that is so obedient, obedient unto death, that it will do anything I command. He said, how are you going to do that in my ragtag nation? He says, I will do it. Give me the opportunity. So the king of Hu thought about it and said, well, I have over a hundred concubines. He's somewhat like King Solomon, wasn't he? And he said, all of these ladies of my royal court, if you can take these undisciplined ladies and turn them into an army, of discipline within one day, then I will appoint you as my general. And Sung Tzu said to the king of Wu, he said, I will do it on one condition, and that is that I have absolute authority, and that my decision is binding. 
And he said, sure, you'll never be able to do it with my ladies, off you go. So he gathered the ladies, and the king had two favorite wives, so he divided them into two groups, and he took the favorite wife of the king, and he put them in charge of one group, and the second favorite he put in charge of another group. And then he said, now, you will give orders, but I don't give you orders by mouth. I give you orders by signs. I will use a drum. Now you must listen carefully because this is an allegory. I will give you a drum. Now it works very simple. If the drum beats once, you will all, in harmony, turn to the right. If the drum beats twice, you will all, in harmony, turn to the left. If it beats three times, you will turn all the way around and face the other way. Do we all understand each other? Yes, we do. Giggle, giggle. He says, let's try it. So he beats the drum. Boom. And they go all over, giggling and laughing. He says, let's try that again. And he goes through the ritual. He beats the drum once. He beats the drum twice. He beats the drum three times. And there's total disarray and disharmony. So he says, Perhaps I did not make myself clear. Let me explain this to you again. And he explains it meticulously in many, many forms so that they cannot possibly misunderstand it. And then he says, let's do it again. If the drum beats once, you turn to the right. All at the same time in harmony, etc. So he beats the drum. And they turn and the one giggles and the other one does this and the other says, and he, Terrible disaster. Eventually he says, I don't think I've made myself clear. Let me explain this to you nicely again. So he goes through the whole process, explains it to them, asks them whether they all understand. They say, yes, they understand. And he goes through the same ritual with the same disastrous results. And then he says, fine. You know what you must do. You refuse to do it. And because you refuse to do it, that is insubordination. And the penalty for insubordination is death. And so the two leading ladies, will you come forward? Because you are now going to suffer the death penalty. And some people see that he's serious. So they run to the king of Wu and they say, King Wu, He's going to kill your wives. So he sends an order. This is the king of Wu. He sends an order. You will not touch my favorite wives. You will not do it. And Song Tzu says, I have been given absolute authority. And he takes his sword and he chops both of their heads off. And he has them taken away. And he chooses two ladies out of each group and says, you come stand in the front here and you're going to stand in front of this group. Now let me explain the ritual to you again. And he explains it to them perfectly. And then he says, when the drum beats once, you'll turn to the right. If it beats twice, you would turn to the left. If it turns three times, you turn all the way around. You understand? And he says, let's try that. Boom. What do you think happened? absolute perfect obedience and he went through the ritual and the king was devastated his favorite wives were dead so he decided to ban Sung Tzu and told him go away I don't want you eventually the situation became so bad in his kingdom that he had no choice and so he summoned Sung Tzu to come and take over the generalship of his nation. And the general became world famous. And he conquered all those lands back and gave them all back to the king of Wu. What are we talking about here? We're talking about Catholicism and Protestantism. We're talking about the king of Wu, who happens to be the Pope. 
And we're talking about Sun Tzu, who happens to be the general, with absolute authority. Now let's have a look at what his strategy would be in the art of war. And we're going to look at some of the slides and, and see where they lead us. He has a number of plans and he divides them into categories. The first one is laying plans. I've just taken some of the highlights. Point 18 is all warfare is based on deception. By the way, is that biblical? Did Christ use deception in his war against Lucifer, yes or no? No. So deception is a strategy which you will not find with God, it's the strategy that you will find with the enemy of God. All warfare is based on deception. Hence, when able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must seem inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. When far away, we must make him believe we are near. Hold out bait to entice the enemy. Feign disorder. Crush him. If he's taking his ease, give him no rest. If his forces are united, separate them. Excuse me, how many Protestant groups were there? A handful. How many are there now? Over 33,000. Attack him when he is unprepared. Appear where you are not expected. And then he says in point 26, Now the general who wins the battle makes many calculations in his temple. Here the battle is fought. Uh, I have a question. Do generals have temples or do they have forts? Garrisons, whatever. They don't have temples. A temple is a place of sacrificial offering. So this is no ordinary general. This is a priest general. And the only priest generals that we have in the world, we will find them in the Jesuits today, and you will find them in the Knights of Malta. Those are priest generals. And the ultimate general of them all is the Jesuit general. So he sits in his temple and he makes plans. Now how do you wage war? A wise general makes a point of foraging on the enemy. One cartload of the enemy's provisions is equivalent to 20 of one's own. Don't use your own resources. Use those of the enemy. And likewise, a single pickle of the provender is equivalent to 20 from one's own store. In order to kill the enemy, our men must be roused to anger. That there may be advantage from defeating the enemy, they must have their reward. Therefore, in chariot, chariot fighting, when 10 or more chariots have been taken, those should be rewarded who took the first. Our own flags should be substituted for those of the enemy, and the chariots mingled and used in conjunction with ours. The captured soldiers should be kindly treated and kept. This is called using the conquered foe to augment one's own strength. This is a brilliant strategy. And if you think of it in terms of the spiritual war, then it seems obvious to me who wrote this. Now the general is the bulwark of the state. If the bulwark is complete at all points, the state will be strong. If it is defective, the state will be weak. Thus, there are some points which are essential to victory. He will win who knows when to fight and when not to fight. He will win who knows how to handle both superior and inferior forces. And he will win whose army is animated by the same spirit through all its ranks. Absolute obedience to the superior general. No deviation of thought. Loyola wrote, even if God gave you a dog as a general, you will not for one moment hesitate to obey him. He will win who prepared himself, waits to take the enemy unprepared, and he will win with military capacity, he will win who has military capacity and is not interfered with by the sovereign. Now, that's an amazing statement. Tactical disposition. 
Sun Tzu said, the good fighters of old put themselves beyond the possibility of defeat and then waited for an opportunity of defeating the enemy. To secure ourselves against defeat lies in our own hands, but the opportunity of defe defeating the enemy is provided by the enemy himself. You must get the enemy to be complacent. You must get the enemy to be relaxed. And then you defeat him. His victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage. That's an amazing statement. Because whenever a worldly general wins a victory, everybody knows about him. Rommel was famous in Germany. Montgomery was famous in England. The generals that won, they were famous. But this general, his victories bring him neither reputation for wisdom nor credit for courage because nobody even hears his voice. All you hear is the tap of a drum. You don't know who's tapping the drum. He's doing it quietly. He wins his battles by making no mistakes. Please note that this is written just before 1798. Sung Tzu said, The control of a large force is the same principle as the control of a few men. It's merely a question of dividing up their numbers. Fighting with a large un the army under your command is no wise different from fighting with a small one, so it doesn't matter. It's all about strategy. You must hold out bait. A clever combatant looks for the effect of combined energy and does not require too much from individuals. It has to be a team. There has to be an army, but nobody may know that it's there. Sun Tzu said, whoever is first in the field, please note this, and awaits the coming of the enemy will be fresh for the fight. You want to be there first. You don't want to be there last. You don't want the Protestants to start Protestant America. You want to be there first. You want to be there first. You want to make them think they started it, when in actual fact, you started it. Oh, divine art of subtlety and secrecy. What did Jesus say about secrecy? I have done nothing in secret. Nothing. Nothing. Oh, divine art of subtlety and secrecy. Sun Tzu said in war, the general receives his command from the sovereign. Let your plans be dark and impenetrable as night. And when you move, fall like a thunderbolt. Nobody must know what you're doing. There are roads which must not be followed, armies which must not be attacked, towns which must be besieged, positions which must not be content contested. Now listen carefully. Commands of the sovereign which must not be obeyed. So who's in control, the sovereign or the general? If he listens to the commands of the sovereign, if it suits him, but some commands, he refuses to obey, does his own thing, then, uh, well, that can only be a very special general who nobody knows about. There are five dangerous faults which may affect the general, recklessness, etc., cowardice, well, that's not so serious. The army on the march, if soldiers are punished before they have grown attached to you, they will prove, not prove submissive. Therefore, soldiers must be treated in the first instance with humanity, but kept under control by means of iron discipline. Fascinating stuff. Terrain. If fighting is sure to result in victory, then you must fight, even though the ruler forbid it. If fighting will not result in victory, then you must not fight, even if at the ruler's bidding. So here is a general which is totally unlike any human political general. Totally unlike. This is a different general. The general who advances without coveting fame and retreats without fearing disgrace, whose only thought is to protect his country and do good service for his sovereign, is the jewel 
of his kingdom. You might look as if you've been defeated, but it might be a strategic loss. Then it gets even more fascinating as we go on, the nine situations. It is the business of the general to be quiet and thus ensure secrecy. Upright and just and thus maintain order. He must be able to mystify his officers and men. Listen carefully. He must be able to mystify his officers and men by false reports and appearances and thus keep them in total ignorance. This is interesting. So amongst his own ranks, there can be people that have no idea of what the ultimate strategy is, except that when they hear the sound of the drum, they will turn in unison. He carries his men deep into hostile territory before he shows his hand. When invading hostile ter territory, the general principle is that penetrating deeply brings cohesion. Penetrating but a short way means dispersion. Success in warfare is gained by carefully accommodating ourselves to the enemy's purpose, by persistently hanging on the enemy's flanks. Will he leave his enemy alone? Never! And will he press an advantage? When fire breaks out inside the enemy's camp, respond at once with an attack from outside. Relentless, relentless. Now this one I found particularly interesting. The use of spies. There are all kinds of spies. There are local spies, inward spies, converted spies, doomed spies, surviving spies. Let's look at these interesting categories. When these five kinds of spies are all at work, none can discover the secret system. This is called divine <coughs> manipulation of the threads. Are you getting an interesting vibe here? It is the sovereign's most precious faculty. Having local spies, meaning employing the service of inhabitants of the district. So there where you are, you have your local spies. Wherever you go, you have a local spy. Having inward spies is making use of officials of the enemy. Converted spies, getting hold of the enemy's spies and using them for your own purposes. And then you have doomed spies, doing certain things openly for purposes of deception and allowing our spies to know of them and report them to the enemy. Can you believe that? That you will sacrifice your own people for the sake of victory? So if one of your own is given a position or a job to do, which is diametrically opposed to what the government is saying in that area, or the people. You have your own people expose them to the government and endear yourself to the government, even if it means the death of your spy. And then you have surviving spies. Finally are those who bring back news from the enemy's camp. Hence it is that which none of the whole army are more intimate relations to be maintained than with spies. None should be more liberally rewarded. In no other business should greater secrecy be preserved. <laughs> Fascinating stuff. The enemy spies who have come to spy on us must be sought out, tempted with bribes, led away, comfortably housed. Thus they will become converted spies and available for our service. This is how the Jesuit general thinks and operates. You cannot understand his machinations and you will never unravel the mystery if you do not have prophecy to rely on. You'll never unravel the mystery. That's why there's so much confusion. Who's the enemy? Nobody even knows that there is an enemy. It is through the information brought by the converted spy that we are able to acquire and employ local and inward spies. It is owing to his information again that we can cause the doomed spy to carry false tidings to the enemy. Lastly, it is by his information that the surviving spy can be used on appointed occasions. So spies are everywhere. 
So deception, deception, deception is the name of the game. This book was published under the generalship of General Ricky. So he understood. He probably wrote it. Now history tells us that this poor general was rejected and his society rejected in the Catholic world. Eventually, he was banned by the Pope and put into prison. A very luxurious prison, a massive church right next to the Vatican with a tunnel under the ground connecting the Vatican to this day. The Society of Jesus could conquer though believed dead, could not its superior general do the same? When Lorenzo Ricci died in his cell at Castel de Angelo on November 24, 1775, what if his death was no more physical than the supposed disestablishment of his army? Lesser mystics than Ricci, who secretly commanded the Rosicrucians, have been known to die and then at the opportune moment to be resurrected. So here is the general of the Jesuits. He's put into jail, and the time is just before 1798. And the Bible tells me that the beast out of the sea seemed to have a mortal wound. It doesn't say it had a mortal wound. The Bible said, one of the heads seemed to have a mortal wound. Now what if this mortal wound was a strategy by the greatest general of that time? The brilliant mind of General Ricky. Now let's go to the United States of America at this particular time when the general was supposedly locked up and eventually Died. During the fall of 1775, Congress authorized a committee made up of Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Lynch. Now, please note the problem. The Catholic Church, Jesuits are not welcome in Protestant nations. Here is a new nation arising. It is a colony of Great Britain where the Jesuits are banned. And they start a organization in this, in this new land where there will be freedom of religion, but that requires a particular constitution. Now, freedom of religion would also naturally mean that the Jesuits cannot be banned under such a constitution. Are you with me? That's a very clever constitution, because if you give freedom to all, then you have to allow these people to operate. So, Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Lynch, Benjamin Harrison, and George Washington, all of them, either deists or cultists or high masons, came together and decided that they were going to wage war with Great Britain if necessary and declare themselves independent, and they had to have a flag. So they created what was called the Flag Committee. And they traveled to Cambridge, Massachusetts. There, according to the only known account of its proceedings, given in Robert Allen Campbell's book, Our Flag, the committee mysteriously shared its authority with a total stranger. And this stranger was an elderly European transient known as the Professor. He had arrived from parts unknown at Summer's End. And was he perhaps the prisoner of Castel San? Angelo, supposedly holed up in this prison, having constant access with his crony, his king of Wu, having a conversation, and then slipping away to oversee the forming of the new land and the ultimate overthrow of true Protestantism and Protestantism of that time in one brilliant move. So they tell us ample time to manage the election of the papacy had been there, to relax, pack important things, the philosopher's death, and then take a three-month voyage to Boston Harbor. 
Since his arrival, the professor had occupied a guest room in a private Cambridge home, whose hostess, one of his earnest and intelligent disciples, would remember him in a diary, again cited in history book, as a quiet and very interesting member of the family. So here the leading men come together. Now, the seat of the government had already been established, and we will see how it had been established and by whom in a moment. On July the 3rd, 1776, that's a day before the signing of the Constitution. July the 4th is a holiday to this day, isn't it? John Adams took pen in hand and dashed off a letter to his wife Abigail. Abig uh, Adams was a writer of the Mozartean facility, concentration and confidence, etc. Everything he ever wrote was first draft and good. He never got stuck for words. He never edited. And he said, yesterday, which would have been July 2nd, the greatest question was decided which ever was debated in America, and a greater perhaps never was nor will be decided amongst men. A resolution was passed without one dissenting colony that these united colonies are and of right ought to have full power to make war, conclude peace, establish commerce, and to do all other acts and things which other states may rightfully do. The second day of July 1776 will be the most memorable date in the history of America. Now nobody celebrates the second. They all celebrate the fourth. Now, Manny Palmer Hall is a very prominent Masonic historian. And his books are well known in Masonry. And uh, he writes an interesting story, and he states the following. Quote, It was a grave moment, and not a few of those present feared that the lives would be the forfeit of their audacity. In the midst of the debate, a fierce voice rang out. The debater stopped and turned to look upon the stranger. Who was this man who had suddenly appeared in their midst and transfixed them with his oratory? They had never seen him before. None knew when he had entered, but his tall form and pale face filled them with awe. His voice ringing with holy zeal, the stranger stirred them to their very souls. His closing words rang through the building. God has given America to be free. As the stranger sank into a chair exhausted, a wild enthusiasm burst forth. Name after name was signed on the Declaration of Independence. Who had lifted for a moment the veil from the eyes of the assemblage and revealed to them a part of at least of the great purpose for which the new nation was conceived? He had disappeared, nor was he ever seen again or his identity established. Who was the strange man that oversaw the flag committee and they chose the flag of a Jesuit-owned company as the new flag of the United States of America. Which means that it became part of a Jesuit company. Interesting. And who was this man who appeared? Now, the state of America, the government seat, is in the area called Maryland. Maryland is an interesting name. For example, it's granted in the liturgical calendar of Rome. We recall how the original settlers of Maryland, many of whom were Roman Catholics, set sail from England under the spiritual direction of Jesuit father Andrew White. On November 22, 1633, so, a lot of work had been done already. This is more than a century before. The preparation had been made. And they set sail, and they were preparing the ground. So, November 27, 1633, Andrew White arrived. November 22 is the feast day of St. Cecilia. 
the third century Roman martyr and traditional patroness of the musicians, and you know, did her spirit go along? The voyagers reached landfall on March the 25th, which is Annunciation Day. That's the feast where the angel Gabriel appears to Mary and tells her that she will conceive the Messiah. Hmm. Planting the divine seed within a virgin matrix. Did the settlers imagine themselves planting the seed of a new social order in this strange wilderness? Now, on Annunciation Day, 1634, Father White consecrated the colony of Maryland to the Virgin Mary. The second day of July on, in the year 1776 was Visitation Day. Now, when, when you look at Medici learning, it is an occult practice where numerology plays an enormous part. And numerology is intertwined in everything that they do. Everything is timed numerologically. Never do they do anything without their calendar according to the liturgy. In the year 1776, it was celebrated on July the 2nd. Is that when they made the decision to become independent? And this is according to the New Catholic Encyclopedia. Now, the land which occupies the seat of the government all belonged to the Jesuits. It was Jesuit land. And they, in inverted commas, donated it to the United States new government. The manor house in which Andrew White took his home or took his place was the manor house of Andrew White, known as the White House. Everybody believes today that it's the White House because it's painted white. No, it's not the White House because it's painted white. It is the manor house of Andrew White. And the name Andrew White is, in addition, still important cabal. Because in the Bible, the brother of Peter was named what? Andrew. Andrew. So there was Peter in Rome and Andrew in the new colony. And the needle faces directly in the direction of Rome. And it's fascinating. When we go into that history, I don't have time for all of those details. Visitation Day's scriptural basis is the Virgin Mary's ecstatic sermon to Elizabeth at Luke 1, 46-55, this famous ejaculation known as the Magnificat, the opening word of the Latin Vulgate, rendering for the passage meaning it magnifies. And it literally defines the social action called for by the Sacred Heart in Philadelphia on the 2nd of July, 1776. So here is the numerology. Now, the words that Gabriel spoke are as follows. My soul does magnify the Lord, or this is what uh, Mary sang. This is her song. My soul does magnify the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour, for he has regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. Now, if you think in an occult way, you will twist this around, and you will make this the song of those who venerate Mary. For he that is mighty has done to me great things, and holy is his name, and his mercy is in them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arms, he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts, he has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. Who in this context would be those that were sent away empty-handed? Protestantism. Now, wouldn't it be a brilliant strategy 
if you had sent them away empty-handed, believing that they are in full control, and in fact they control absolutely nothing. Because you were in the field before they got there. You had taken over the field, and by deception, you had led them to believe that there was no danger at all. Because the Jesuit order had been banned. It didn't exist. Interesting. He has scattered the proud in the imaginations of things, has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. So those who ruled the kings of England and the Protestant world were defeated without them even knowing that they were defeated. Now if you look at a little bit of numerology, it becomes very interesting. The year of independence has perfect Kabbalistic design of sixes and sevens. To be at sixes and sevens is an occult expression. And we use it today to say you don't really know where you're at. You don't know what to do, you don't really know what to decide. And uh, that's what the enemy wants to distill. You don't, want to, you don't know what's happening, you don't know what to do. Now, if we look at it, this is the, the numerology that is put on the base of the dollar. It is the year 1776, numerologically written. If you look at it, MDC, in its numerology, works out to 1,600. So there's a 1, a 6, and a 0, and a 0. So the ones that count are the 1 and the 6. So that would make a 7, but it could also be the 6. CLX, 160, 1 plus 6, again it makes 7, but it's also a 6. And then uh, the 16, of course, 1 plus 6, again, is 7. But not only that, the numbers also make a different numerology. It would see an encapsulation of the very origin of the Society of Jesus, because NDC officially also stands for Milici du Christ, which is the official name for the Jesuits and the Knights of Malta. It's the Christian militia. It's the army of Rome. So that's their official designation. So that's the first part. The official classification of the Templars and the Society of Jesus. And then the MDC also produces Medici, which was the family name of Pope Leo X, who was the Pope when the confrontation with Luther came. Fascinating. CLX specifies the Ignatian era, which historians have ever since called the century of Leo X. So there you have that. And the last three, the century of Leo X, the 16th century. So you have everything there. Who's really in control and who rules the United States of America? Well, Quigley told us in the last lecture, there is a small group of elitists that rule the world, and I am part of that group. Did he not say that? All countries had expelled the Jesuits, shipping them all over the place. By 1773, the suppression was, was complete, and Ricky was supposedly in jail. August 17, Ricky, the unfortunate, this is what the history books tell us, the unfortunate general was bundled off to prison in Castel Sant'Angelo with a tunnel underneath where he could make his arrangements with the Pope. We languished for two years, not even permitted to celebrate Mass or receive visitors, so the history tells us. Eventually he died on November 24, 1775, after 15 years as general. Now it gets very fascinating. He testified to the end that the society was innocent. By order of Pope Pius VI, please note, by order of Pope Pius VI, his solemn funeral was held in the church of San Giovanni de Florentini. His body was taken to the Gesù, which is written with a G, according to the Latin, a few hundred meters away and laid to rest in the crypt with the generals who preceded him. However, Ricky's imprisonment and death and the letter of suppression did not bring the desired end of the society, 
the letter was valid only in those countries where it was officially promulgated. So they didn't die out completely. There were nations where they were still there. But this general was now supposedly dead. And the one who had him buried was none other than Pius VI. Now, if you look at Pius VI, what happened to him? He was the Pope who was captured by Napoleon's general and the papacy died and the Vatican lost its political clout. This is a brilliant strategy. Who can fight an enemy that's dead? He no longer exists. He seemed to have a mortal wound. A well-planned strategy in the high elite to remove the enemy so that the enemy is no longer visible. And then behind the scenes, when your enemy least expects it, you are already in the field and have taken control of what they believe to be their master stroke of strength. It's a brilliant strategy. Frederick of Prussia recognized the value of the Jesuits, so they stayed there. Catherine II of Russia forbade the promulgation, so the Jesuits stayed there. And the generals were elected in Russia to continue the visible operation. But they weren't allowed to be called general anymore, per se. Uh, here are the various successors. They have Russian names and Eastern names. And uh, the fathers called the Second Congregation of White Russia and elected a new member. Eventually, they elected as vicar general. He held the office until he died on November the 10th. And uh, eventually, in a papal brief dated 1801, it was permitted that the general superior would no longer be designated as vicar general, but with the title of general as was held before the suppression. So, in 1801, the general was again called general. Just general. So for a brief period, he went underground. And he established a power base. And the Bible says, as I saw the first beast disappear with a mortal wound, I looked and I saw a second beast. The second beast, would it do the bidding of the first beast, yes or no? Now, if you do the bidding of the first beast, under whose command are you? You must be under the command of the first beast without anyone knowing it. Because how can you command anything if you're dead? It's not possible. So here was a strategy. And this strategy has been the strategy of the generals of the Jesuit order to this day. Who is the enemy and how must the enemy be destroyed. That will be part of the next lecture. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a brilliant strategy. Protestants, Protestants sitting there in their confidence. And if I read the history books, they say that the papal power had ceased to exist. Who could expect anything from this power? When in actual fact, a brilliant strategist had made it appear as if it were dead. It seemed to have a mortal wound. And how complacent the Protestants have become. Help us to be watchmen on the walls of Zion. Amen.